Thank you for coming. I'm uh, Sam Crabtree, and may maybe my, uh, my role for participation here tonight is that I'm on the board at Bethlehem College and Seminary, where Andy Nacelli is employed. I'm also a pastor at Bethlehem Baptist Church, where Andy is a candidate for eldership at the church. And uh, I'm particularly pleased in my introducing of him to say that he also leads a small group, and we value small group participation around here. He and his wife, Jenny, who's here. Jenny, wave to those who are, yes, in the house. Thank you. Uh, they bless my hearts in their participation in small group leadership because in our regular training meetings for small group leaders, they, one of them will babysit while the other one comes, and they trade off. And then sometimes they even get a babysitter so that they can come to the meetings, and it's a real encouragement to me. Andy uh, is uh, a man of words, a uh, man of letters, and his vitae is very long. The, the articles that he's published and the books that he's published, I want to mention just two of them. One of them is the feature for tonight, but he's also been the, he was the chief cook and bottle washer for this NIV study Bible and uh, coordinated all the other writers under D.A. Carson and uh, a, a major work. And I want to mention it, and it's available at the book table after the session is over, and it's also, for those who are watching the video, it's available online, and, and um, the publisher would be happy to have you pick up a copy for your own study and reference, and, and I'd be happy to have you pick up a copy of it for your own growth in Christlikeness, for isn't that the point? Don't we want to all grow in Christlikeness and present every man mature in Christ as Paul teaches us in Colossians. Our, our cause for being together tonight is this book on conscience, and here's the way we'll do the evening. Uh, I'm going to ask a few general questions to Andy about this, and he can run with those questions whatever direction he feels God prompting him and whatever his conscience is free to do on that. And, and then we're going to open it up to you to ask questions, and I, I will say for those of you on this side, you have a little bit of a disadvantage because the microphone that they've set up is over on this side of the auditorium. And it would help for recording if you make your way to the microphone. And it would help that if the question you ask is actually a question that you ask and not your own little presentation or testimonial on, on uh, whatever your conscience is telling you to do. Right, that's two conscience jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's unconscionable. Uh, <laughs> and we really do want to scratch where you itch and so do be thinking of questions as Andy talks about you'd like some clarification or you have an, uh, an, uh, an instance or an issue in your own life where you think, I need a little coaching here, a little help on what, what should my conscience be thinking, what should it be doing, what, how should I be feeling about these issues, whatever they may be, because we want this to be not just some lofty intellectual academic exercise, but we want this to um, end up in Christians acting more Christianly for the glory of God for the good of the culture that we serve, because when we work for their welfare, we work for our own welfare, the Bible teaches us. And this is not a joke, and we want our consciences to be clear mm -hmm. as we deal with a subject like this or any other subject as well. So, uh, I've got a stack of questions if you're uh, too self-conscious or you can't think of anything. I've got some questions, but we really want to lean in to your questions. But before we do that, let's ask God to help us with this. So, Father in heaven, we recognize that he who speaks should speak as it were the oracles of God and that he who serves should serve in the strength that you supply so that in all things you would get the glory through Christ. And that's what we want. Uh, Andy and I are not up here because we think we're particularly clever. We're not up here because we think we're more significant than any people here gathered. Paul was very clear in teaching us, don't, don't do anything out of conceit. Consider others more significant than yourself. And that's the spirit in which we want to go into this interaction over this subject. It's not mainly about selling a book, but about serving the church of Jesus Christ. Our aim tonight is love. Love. Helping people supremely value that which is supremely valuable and 
acting like they supremely value that which is supremely value. We want a love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And if you help us, that will result, and it will be fruitful evening. By your omnipotent obstacle overcoming Holy Spirit, remove the debris from our own hearts and our own heads so that we can fully attend to what we should pay attention to here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Andy, you've written a book on conscience, and you're doing an interview here about it, so let me start with the interview. What are your aims in doing this? I mean, it's a lovely summer evening. You could have stayed in your backyard and done something with your children. And, uh... Yeah, thank you, David Clifford, for having the idea to do this. Uh, I wouldn't have thought of it, and I wouldn't be here if this wasn't my book. I would be outside after the winter. This is the first really good week we've had of good weather, and I'm, I'm shocked anyone came, so thank you for coming. Uh, my goal tonight is to try to just give an overview of the book. If you ask those kind of questions and specifics as you ask more questions, and I'd love it if you got interested in this topic and were able to grow yourself and then help others grow as well. It's a neglected topic. But, uh, but I know you well enough to know yeah. that you're not just here to sell a book. You're not here just to get people to go to the book table and get a book or people that are watching the video right. to buy a product that, to that's put That's a on myth that... We make money by selling books. If your name's John MacArthur or Rick Warren, you make money. Or John Piper gives it all away. But, you know, uh, this is not for money. This is so because then, I love the topic. So, so what, what do you hope for them? I want them to think about their conscience, how to, how to deal with their own conscience, and then how to interact with other people's conscience as well. So kind of two levels. First your own, then others. And it's pretty complicated when you... Move on to others. Okay, then, what is, what is conscience? Define it. Or what is conscientiousness? <laughs> Those are two different things, yeah. Um, well, conscience, before I define it, let me just describe it. It's, it's something that seems independent. Sometimes there's this voice in your head that's saying something, and you, you wish it would stop talking. Like, there are people who commit the perfect murder, and, like, 20 years later, they'd give themselves up to the police because they couldn't silence that voice in their head. So whatever it is, it seems independent. It's, you can't totally control it. And it's something that is a gift. It's not something we want to get rid of and like a cancer to cut out. It's almost like your gift of, of sense. If you were to you know, brush your finger over a hot stove, what does your hand do reflexively? It's, it pulls back because we have nerves that God gave us and senses that tell us, don't do that, you're going to hurt yourself. In, this, in a similar way, the conscience is a gift to tell us, don't do that, you're going to hurt yourself. So it's a gift, it's, it's something independent. I can go on and on here, but basically it's, it's, uh, it's something we have because we're made in God's image. You pull it together and define it. Um, I've tried to do it in a kind of a memorable way. It's your consciousness, your awareness, your sense of what you believe is right and wrong. So I could unpack that more, but that's, I'm going to try to give you short answers, so that's, that's where I'd well, go. Okay, you could unpack that more. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, it's your consciousness of what you believe is right and wrong, meaning it's not what actually is right and wrong. So I'm not going to call on any of you tonight and try to illustrate this here, but let's just say... Thank you. In the, in the broader culture, if you, if you watch news on TV or follow just the mainstream culture, what they think about issues like, say, same-sex marriage. Um, there are many people who think that that is a civil rights issue and that they need to defend that in order to have a clear conscience. There are people who defend a woman's right to abort the they call it fetus, or I would call it the baby in their womb. And I think that's a, a civil rights issue, and that if you don't defend that, uh, if, if a person didn't defend that, they wouldn't have a clear conscience. That's how some people's consciences work. So just because your conscience says something is right or wrong, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Your conscience could be wrong because it's based on an immoral standard. So that's why I say your conscience is your consciousness of what you believe is right and wrong. What you believe might be wrong. And so you, uh, how, yeah. how can you know? Well, Pastor Crabtree, uh, 
I mean, I'll, I'll pose it this way. Uh, uh, well, not, not this okay. particular version of the Bible, but uh, <laughs> the Bible is what you'd need, yeah. Because I think, I think there's nobody in the house and probably nobody watching this video, probably, who would say, you know what, I'm always right. I'm always right. I am. I'm always right. I'm never wrong. Nobody would say that. I know. But at any moment, <laughs> okay. <laughs> One's running for president, but go ahead. <laughs> but at any moment, all these people who would not make the claim, I'm always right, at any and every moment, we all think we are right. Yeah. Right now, everybody in this house thinks they're right in what they're thinking. Because if you thought you were wrong, you would change to something else, and then you would think that you were right. About their convictions. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or anything else that you, you sat in the right place or, okay. or that person in front of you should do something with their hair or whatever you're thinking. Okay, now, um, but you're saying there's an objective right mm -hmm. that should inform our right. consciences because right. your conscience could be wrong when you think you're right. How do you get it, how do you get it to the place where I think I'm right, yeah. but I actually am right? Um, it's just complicated because I, even right now, I could probably give you areas where I think I'm right, but I'm, I'm not sure, I'm still thinking about issues, and there are probably issues where you, you might have changed your mind even over the last 10 years, where you changed your view on something. Mm -hmm. So we're always in process. No one's conscience in here perfectly matches God's conscience. Not God's conscience, God's will. God does have a conscience, that's another issue. It's just his never condemns him. A conscience is part of personhood. Uh, so back to your question is, what you need to do is Inform your conscience with truth, both inside the Bible and outside the Bible, and inform it with, with truth with due process. It's going to take time. It's not something that you can do immediately all the time. Sometimes you have to think through issues and give it time. And I could, want me to give you specifics? You got one? Um, yeah, I, I just saw a couple doctors walk in the back there, uh, Dr. Paul and Susan Lim. There's Dr. Matt Anderson right here. Um, they're, they're professional doctors. This is what they do. I'm, I'm not that kind of doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. Sometimes I wish I were because I need their help often with my kids and sometimes me. And on this particular issue of whether in, uh, in vitro fertilization is something that people who are pro-life should practice, I hadn't even thought of that carefully until I heard the limbs give a presentation in the Bethlehem College and Seminary Chapel and then I talked to Matt Anderson uh, over, I think, a dinner at one time. And then he, I read some articles he wrote for World Magazine. And that got my mind thinking, whoa, there's another side to this issue I didn't know about. That then informed how, I, how, how my conscience reacted to that issue. So what changed was not what I believe the Bible teaches. What changed was truth outside the Bible about an issue. And then my conscience changed based on the additional truth I learned. So you following me? Yes. Yeah. So a few sentences ago, yeah. you alluded to the fact that God never, never changes His conscience. Right. Right. Uh, never. So he went in the in the Bible when it says that He repented Himself, that He made Saul king, or He regretted that He made the pre-Noah flood population the way they were. You're saying he really didn't, really didn't change his mind there. Well, whatever that means, it can't mean that he sinned or that he messed up or that he didn't think it through carefully enough. It just means that God, that sin can grieve God. It doesn't mean that he's, his, his conscience is pricking him yeah. because he messed yeah. up. Yeah. Not at all. So when you said that we're all growing and things we thought 10 years ago we might not think now and yeah. we're, we're making improvement, God's excluded from that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's the absolute standard yeah. you are saying. Yeah. yeah. I think every person has a conscience, including Adam and Eve before they sinned. It just didn't condemn them. The, con the condemning part of conscience came after the fall. You also said there's this little yeah. voice in your head. Yeah. Head. Do you have room for biblical language that says there's a little voice in your heart? Is well, there a difference? Is that the same thing? Is hey, this thing? is complicated because <laughs> there's, there's not a Hebrew word for conscience. There, it's one of the few theologically significant words in the Bible where there's not a, a Hebrew word and a Greek word that kind of match up. And the Hebrew word that sort of matches up is the word lave, heart. So, you know, David's heart smote him. That's King James. I grew up on the King James. Uh, he was convicted. His heart convicted him. That won't hurt the sale of this. <laughs> <anything>. <laughs> uh, 
yeah. So, yeah, sometimes, and you know, well, First John, even in, in the New Testament, if your heart condemns you. So sometimes heart and conscience are, are synonymous in that sense. I thought where you were going to go with that was, is there a difference between your conscience communicating to you and the Holy Spirit communicating to you? And that's, that's a little trickier to, to sift through. Um, often people ask, how do I know when it's the Holy Spirit? How do I know when it's my conscience? And the best answer I know to give is, well, if your conscience is going against Scripture, you know it's not the Holy Spirit. If it's functioning accurately, it's lining up with Scripture, then the Holy Spirit's using your conscience. I don't know how to distinguish them. Yeah. And could we say that it's possible for a person to think that they're behaving in accordance with the Scripture and they haven't been exegeting the Scripture very well? Huh. Yes. Is there a seminary that you could recommend for people who want to? <laughs> you don't need to go to seminary. You, well, it would help, but you just listen to good sermons and study the Bible. You know, look at good study Bibles. Uh, look, seriously, just study your Bible carefully. Have community. Listen to good preaching. That's going to train you how to think carefully about Scripture. And a little asterisk. Yeah. The Paul and Susan Lim presentation at the yep. Bethlehem College and Seminary Chapel. Mm -hmm. Is that available on the Bethlehem College and Seminary website? It is. Okay, it for is. those who and want to check that out yeah. and, and fuel their, their conscience mm -hmm. about that. Okay, maybe we're ready for the audience, and so I'm going to invite, if any of you have questions, you can start to make your way to the microphone while I ask a few more questions, okay? But don't use my questions as a delay. If you get there, we'll drop my questions and we'll take your questions, okay? So that's a hint to the people that are watching on the uh, video recording of this, that if I keep talking, you people are not interested in this subject, apparently. That's so, not what it means. Or, 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 <laughs> okay. They are starting to move, I see, okay. moving towards the... Um, Paul said in Acts 24, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience. Mm -hmm. Take pains to have a clear conscience, both toward God and man. What's take pains? Well, I don't remember the Greek word offhand, um, but the, the sense is he's working hard to diligently maintain a clear conscience, which means yeah. it implies that this isn't something that just happens. You have to intentionally think about it, discipline yourself to think about how do I maintain a good conscience, a clear conscience. So that's why thinking through it at a time like this with a book like that is, is helpful. It could help you obey Scripture in that way. And he said, I take pain so that I have a clear conscience both toward God and man. Is that different, God oh, yeah, and yeah, man? Yeah, Towards God, it, it's, it's the main issue is your sins against God. Toward other humans, uh, that's, that's the end of the book. Is it's, it's complicated when you try to think about your conscience in relation to another person's conscience. Uh, there are two levels where this is complicated. One is when it's within the same church and there are people in a church who might have really strong opinions about not unimportant things, but less important things, and they want to make those the most important things. And that can cause disunity in a church. church churches often split not over core doctrines, but over trivial things. And often it's because people misunderstand how conscience works. So that's one level. Another level, and I'm looking at my brother back there who's uh, training to cross cultures, um, when you go into a different culture, mm, mm, this mm, is even more complicated, mm, 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 mm. where it, it's, it's so hard to do this. You live in, and swim in the water of your culture, and when you go to another culture, you're immediately going to be seeing what you think are clear sins that in that culture are not necessarily sins to them. And the temptation is for you to pounce on the ones that are like blinking lights to you that aren't to them, and it's going to have some ramifications for your rapport with them and, and whether they even feel convicted when you preach the gospel. Uh, and there, that's what the chapter 6, I think, is in the, in the book about, is that, that particular issue. And that's why I co-authored this book, by the way. My, the co-author is named J.D. Crowley, who's been a missionary for 25 years in Cambodia. He grew up as a missionary in Japan. He knows Asian culture really well. His, his insights there are fantastic. So it's helpful to you if you're going yeah. to a different culture to interact with somebody who's a little bit familiar with that culture. <laughs> yeah, my friend JD says it, it takes sometimes 20, 30, 40 years to really feel at home in a culture, to really know it, to feel like it's yours. Let me just stay with this for just a minute. Yeah. So, you're a guy, and you're going to marry a woman. 
Is that a different culture than you're used to? How do I prepare for these conversations? Okay. <laughs> I've never even heard this question. Hang on. Uh, I mean, so is your conscience helped by Jenny? Can okay, she? that's where you're going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you need to listen to somebody else other than just your own inner calculations of what. Did right you talk and what's before? Wrong. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We might talk afterwards. Oh, so yeah, afterwards. yeah. I need my wife. Um, one of the ways she helps me uh, calibrate my conscience is how I, how I come across to people. Um, her emotional intelligence is off the charts, and mine is growing but not as mature as hers. And she regularly helps me think more about how I can love people and how I communicate. So that's the way she helps yeah. me. So I, I'm, I'm opening, I hope this is a soft lob, yeah. but when I said, how do you calibrate your, your conscience? You, you padded a Bible, said, mm -hmm. be in the Word. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about community? Does that help? Oh, totally. So not just your church leaders, but fellow church members who can look into your life and tell you when you have cream cheese on your face and you're oblivious to it. Yeah, you need, you need community. Speaking of wives, the guy that set up this uh, event right now, his wife is at the microphone. So, Evelyn, if you need to adjust the... Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah there we go. Uh, you said that conscience is a gift. Yeah. And my questions are about children and conscience. And so, first of all, uh, I have a, a number of questions concerning children and conscience. First of all, are children given different degrees of sensitivity in their conscience? And are there things that parents, or in my case, grandparents, mm -hmm. can do to increase sensitivity mm -hmm. in conscience? Are there things that we can do that dull our children's mm -hmm. conscience in a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a negative effect? Good questions. Everybody hear the questions? Yeah. Okay, good. So, she's walking away, so I can't clarify with her. All right, well, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, your first question was, do they have different levels of sensitivity? Yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes this goes hand-in-hand hand with personalities. So, some personalities are cavalier, you know, brah, don't think about consequences. They don't, so I've got three little girls, and they're three different little girls. Some are more sensitive than others at different times for different things. So, totally, yes, there's going to be a spectrum for what children feel guilt for, at different times. You ask, can we influence them? Yes, 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 yes. And I don't want to act like I'm a parent expert. My kids are ages seven, five, and three, so I'm just new at this. But I've been a kid, so I, I know it from that end. And parents can have family rules that are not Bible rules and can fail to distinguish that with their children in a way that the children grow up thinking that that certain family rules are equivalent to Bible rules. So an example I often give here is, is biting your fingernails or making your bed in the morning. You know, we have, I haven't written these out, but we probably have like 100 or 200 rules in our house of, you know, take your shoes off when you come in, eat this way, go here. After, I, I, I can't even keep track of all of them. We make them up as we go just to keep order. Uh, they're not Bible, though. They're not Bible. But because we're their parents, we expect them to follow them. So what they need to be thinking is, I need to make my bed, or I need to not to bite my nails, or I need to eat my food at dinner time, because mommy and daddy say so, and they're my parents. And when they say so, I need to follow what they say, unless it contradicts Scripture. How do you teach that to a kid? Uh, you have to just over and over tell them, remind them, that certain rules are family rules, others are Bible rules. You know, the Smith family over here, they get to play this video game and they get to watch this movie and they go here and we're in the cellies and we don't do that. And that doesn't mean that they're sinning, it just means well, this is our family rule. You have to just say this over and over and over of distinguishing family rules and Bible rules. And right now you're under my roof, I'm your authority. It's really clear and easy for what you should do is just obey mom and dad. Now we can talk about the whys, but you know, why should I not do this or, or should I do that as I get older? But when we start little, it's just black and white, mommy says so, daddy says so. As I get older, it'll get more complicated. You could probably teach me here. Uh, let, let me just follow that. Yeah. I don't know if Evelyn wants to go there, but as they get older. Okay, so now picture the future. Yeah. You're the parent of adult children. And some mm -hmm. of your um, values that you right. really hoped they would right. absorb, right. they didn't. Right. And now they're raising their children in ways you wouldn't raise those grandchildren. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate those waters? You pray. You don't want to undermine the parents of children in a way that your grandkids think 
you know better than their mommy and daddy? I've not been in the situation, so this is theoretical right now. Um, and you don't go against your conscience when you're with the, your grandkids, so you, you can't sin there. Do you have a specific in mind to flesh this out maybe? No? No, not really. Okay. I guess I was just thinking of, you know, what... I think specifically harmful ways that we dull children's consciences. Yeah. Um, Did well, you hear maybe, what she said there? Was she close enough to the mic? She was talking about parents can live in certain ways that actually dull a child's conscience. Yeah. So we have, my wife and I have a daughter who regularly asks questions like, I have one asked this question this morning when we were about to leave to meet with the church. She said, is it okay that I think I look pretty? Like she's got this conscience to think, maybe I'm sinning. And well, you don't just say, just, just get in the car. Like that's a dumb question. You, uh, I think my wife answered this question and said, uh, no, that's not necessarily sinful. It depends on your motives. And if it's not a vain kind of, I think I look pretty, but you're thanking God that, you know, he, he gave you your hair and he helped you look nice. That's, that's not wrong. So that, that, this answering those sorts of questions, mm -hmm. um, when they come to you and confess sin, confirm that the, the Holy Spirit's working in their life. This is good. This is good. Recognize that sin. Turn from it. Uh, so basically, at any opportunity you have, when you sense a tenderness, don't squelch that because hmm. that trains them to squelch, to suppress yeah. their conscience. Okay, what's the opposite of squelching? Listening taking it seriously. If, if, if you feel convicted that you might be sinning in an area, you don't want to just block that out of your mind and think, okay, this, I want to forget about that. No, that's, a, that's an opportunity to think, why am I feeling conviction? Is this, is this a conviction for real sin or am I being hypersensitive? That's, that's a, a really good time to think about that. Or if your children show a sensitive conscience, affirm yeah. what's going on yeah. right in that moment yeah. right there. Thank you. Thanks, Evelyn. Next. One second. In an employee-employer relationship where both are Christians, can an employer bind the employee's conscience where Scripture does not, and can the employee submit with a good conscience? Does this change if the employer requires something contrary to Scripture, as in a lifestyle rule or contract? Okay, don't go away. You're saying if an employer says, a Christian employer says to a Christian employee, I want you to do this, or this is our policy, and it's not sin, should the employee follow that? Yes. You're saying that would bind, it, would the employee be going against his conscience? Is that the question? I'm asking this for someone else. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> asking for a friend. Okay. Um. Are you married to this friend? No. Okay. <laughs> because if, it sounds like it might be that the employee thinks that he's doing wrong and he's feeling conviction. It, you never go against your conscience. That's the principle. So if it's a Christian employer, you could just explain the situation. I, I can't do that. Uh, it's never, yeah, as Martin Luther said, it's, it's never safe or right to go against conscience. Yeah. If this is not your question, it's kind of hard to follow up, isn't it? Okay. Um, I'll give some more specifics. So in, okay. a, in a lifestyle contract where the oh, employer says, I, see where you're going. I will, you know, you will not drink alcohol, smoke tobacco, okay. wear jeans that go below your, go above your knees, et cetera. Okay. Um, can a Christian employee who disagrees with that submit in a good conscience? Oh, totally, totally, yeah. He's asking, can, can a, a, an employer have certain dress standards, for example, or lifestyle standards and the person who has to follow those, those aren't his personal standards, but, or her personal standards, but can they go along with that? Absolutely. Uh, all of my friends in the Southern Baptist world, uh, they work for seminaries that have this policy, no drinking alcohol, and most of my friends, if they weren't in that context, would drink alcohol. But they happily don't in that context. They don't need to drink alcohol. It's not a do or die thing. God doesn't command you to drink alcohol. But they could with a good conscience in some circumstances, but they just chose to contextualize in that context so they can minister to people. That's a good thing. Yeah. Next. Is conscience like a worldview? Is conscience like yeah. a worldview? Don't go away. Um, a worldview 
is how you see everything. It's like the filter for how you process all information, how you see the storyline of the Earth's universe's existence. Uh, conscience functions as a guide, a monitor, a witness, a judge. It's not a filter for everything. Uh, maybe you have a more specific way you're, you're going with this? Well, no. I mean, it just sounded like it sounded a little bit like a worldview, how are you describing it, like a way that you look at things. And your so I just wanted to clarify yeah. that it wasn't a worldview, I guess. No, it's not a worldview, but your conscience will act a certain way based on your worldview. Okay. So they're related. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, you actually, so I was here yesterday, and you said something that, that interested, like I, I had a question about, you said you have to, sometimes you have to recalibrate mm -hmm. your conscience. So... I'm thinking about specifically if, uh, or uh, maybe I'm watching certain movies mm -hmm. that should bother me and I shouldn't, but mm -hmm. because my conscience doesn't bother me. Uh, so how do I know if I need to recalibrate, recalibrate my mm -hmm. conscience? And then I guess just, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but how would, how would you go about recal yeah, okay. recalibrating it? Thanks, that's a good question. Um, so just to clarify, you're not feeling troubled about anything, and maybe you should be. Right. So should I feel troubled right. about the fact that I don't feel troubled? Yeah, or maybe I know that I should feel more troubled, and I, but I'm not. And I know that feeling more troubled would help me right. not to do it, but, I'm, but it's not there. Right. Uh, yesterday, uh, I addressed some of the men of Bethlehem about pornography, and I gave seven reasons not to indulge in pornography. And along the way, one of the reasons I... I gave was that pornography ruins your mind and conscience. And on that conscience point, I illustrated that by saying some Christians think that they can view sexually charged nudity in videos with a clear conscience. And I've heard some people try to make a, a case for that, including a theologian named John Frame in his book on ethics. And I've never heard someone defend that in a compelling way. So I would argue that there is, no, I'll say it this way, at best, it's unwise, at best. Uh, but I think it should be part of your conscience, men and women, never to watch sexually charged nudity in any context because I think that's sinful. It's associated with lust. It's associated with sexual morality. It's associated with sins that send people to hell. So why would you entertain yourself with that? And if that's not in your conscience, I think you should add it. Now, that's my, my conviction. Is that kind of what you're, an example of that? You yes. Asked, how does that work? Yeah, so, yes. so then I, I agree with you, but I, I'm sorry, Andy, I just don't feel that way. Or, right, yeah. you're just, you're, you're saying how someone would argue with that. So, uh, you need to start by saying, what does Scripture say? So, that's, that's first, first base, is, you know, what does the Bible say about this issue? And there are many issues where the Bible doesn't address it directly, and you have to look at principles and apply them. You have to look at truth outside Scripture so for some issues. For this one, I don't think you, you need to as much. And you need to give it time. Sometimes you've, you've lived a certain way for decades, and you've never thought about it from another angle. Like, this could be wrong, or maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And you need to think about it a while. And after thinking it through carefully, then you, you pull the trigger and say, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. Or actually, I thought this was sin for all these years, but that's not sin. I can do that. And the first time you do it, it's going to feel awkward. Uh, there, I know some people who think that for a woman to wear makeup is sinful. Uh, I, I disagree, and I don't think you can make a biblical case for that. And if, if a woman came to the conviction that, okay, it's not sinful to wear makeup, the first time she wears makeup, it's going to feel a little awkward probably. Uh, but as long as she knows that that's not the Holy Spirit convicting her of sin, it's not her conscience condemning her, it's this is just feels unusual because it's going against my practice, but the Bible doesn't forbid this. I can do this. And she, she goes ahead with good faith. So, uh, truth, due process. That's the, the short answer. Good question. I mean, we could say more. Yeah. Let, me, let me just linger there a little yeah. bit. You can go, but the, okay, she wears the makeup for the first time and she's feeling something mm -hmm. there that feels like a conscience. So, can you make a distinction between psychological associations and emotions and stuff that could, that could masquerade as conscience and they're not? Like, masquerade is good. Like the person who feels, you know, I really should eat broccoli, but I don't like broccoli. Should I feel guilty about it? I don't like broccoli, which actually I like broccoli, but I mean, 
I eat broccoli because my wife uh, suggests I eat broccoli. But, but I mean, uh, how do I know if what I'm, if the, if the Jiminy Cricket, where's Rick somewhere, Jiminy Cricket who's chirping in my ear saying, you know, don't, you should be eating broccoli. Is that from God or is that just, that's just my culture, that's just my upbringing, that's something yeah, else Yeah, that's where you go back there. and repeat the process. Go to the scripture, go to truth, where is this coming from? And for so many issues like that, it's your culture, it's your mom told you to do this for the first 18 years of your life and it's part of your habits and you just think that's what people should do. It's not always that simple. Yeah. So Andy, my question would be, how would you differentiate training your conscience yeah. and recalibrating your yep. conscience to know the difference between right and wrong? Um, how would you compare and differentiate that with training and shaping your heart to love what you should love, to desire what you should desire? Like, you know, a good, maybe a good example for Grist would be James K. Smith's book that he just released, You Are What You Love, mm -hmm. where he talks about the fact that kind of your overwhelming motivation for doing things and mm -hmm. what kind of governs why you do things is not your worldview, but it's primarily what you desire, and that's primarily shaped and trained by habit and by things that you do over and over and over that feed those desires. How would you compare that with training the conscience about what you think is right and wrong? It's a really good question because uh, heart, again, heart and conscience semantically overlap. So there is a lot of overlap there, but they're not identical. So heart is really uh, part of personhood, it's who you are at the core. Conscience is an instrument. It's, it's, a, it's a mechanism that God uses to shape you. It's, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're identical. Uh, but the way you were, I haven't read uh, Jamie Smith's new book, so I don't know exactly where he's going with that. But from what you said, it sounds like there's a lot of overlap. I thought where you were going to go with that question was, how do you know the difference between calibrating your conscience and sinning against your conscience? Because that's similar to mm. the, the heart issue mm. you brought up. Because mm. mm -hmm. some people could think they're, they're calibrating their conscience when what they're doing is just, just stretching their conscience to, to justify mm -hmm. sin. Or suppressing. Or, or suppressing yeah. it, yeah. And the distinction is when what you're doing is supported by Scripture, you're convinced that this is right based on the Word of God and, you know, and truth, and then you go forward. A, a good biblical example for that is Acts 10 when, when God tells Peter to eat mm. unclean food. Mm -hmm and he's a kosher Jew, and he's never eaten bacon. And he can't, he can't do it with a clear conscience. And, and he tells God three times, no. So God says, Peter, eat this food. No, no, no. And then he finally goes ahead. He recalibrates his conscience to do what God says to do. And sometimes we're like Peter, and we're just so used to doing it our own way. Now, and his is a little different because it's a, between the Old Covenant to New Covenant transition, but we might be used to our tradition, used to our way, and we assume that's what God wants. And then we see in Scripture, oh, actually I have freedom to do that, but it just doesn't feel right. It, that could take some time to calibrate your conscience on that issue. Yeah, we could say more there, but thanks. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Rick? So a couple questions uh, back in the what is it, where is it category, almost definitional kinds of things. So, what is it in a newborn baby? Conscience. What is a conscience in what a newborn is, baby? What is, what oh, is oh, conscience oh. in a newborn baby? That's true. Okay. Um, the way I define or describe conscience is that it's a human capacity, or I'd say it's a capacity for persons, because not just humans have it. And infants and People who have um, disabilities like Downs or who, who as they get older, they might uh, not be able to think coherently and rationally like they could when they were younger. Um, their conscience is not functioning sometimes at all. So it's a capacity for humans. Not all humans have it functioning. So I wouldn't say that it's a, it's a fully developed, mature, functioning mechanism in a, in a newborn baby. There's nothing that's going to condemn that baby on day one. That's, it's, it's not there. They're not feeling guilt for sin. No, you, compass, at all, say, no just, compass at all, even if, if um, uh, deformed by 
the fall? I don't try again. A moral I, compass. I mean, are we born with any kind of a moral compass, even if it's broken or deformed from the fall? Is there anything in conscience that we have that resembles the image of God? Well, yes, that conscience is, we have a conscience because we're made in the image of God. That's why it's there. It's part of personhood. Uh, this is related to the issue of human guilt and sin. I do believe that, that at conception, human beings are in Adam and therefore sinful. Uh, but the, the, the conscious feeling of guilt because of sin, that's going to come later in an infant's life. I don't think from day one. Is that what you're getting at or are you trying to hit on something else? Uh, I'm trying to understand more clearly kind of what it is. I mean, it's clear that like kind of nature or nurture. Yeah. Kind of, it's, it's clear that there's nurture. Yeah. And it gets shaped by culture and experience and sociology and mm -hmm. community. But it's also clear that there's something there to begin with. Yeah. Uh, so as, even as a, a young baby, let's say, is at nursing stage, John Piper gives this illustration in different contexts where he said that when a baby was nursing and would bite, that no Noel would maybe just flick and say, no, no, and just train the baby, that's bad, don't do that, and the baby would know not to do that. I think that's appealing to say that's wrong, and the baby would feel guilt for going against that. So that you can start training that early. But uh, I don't think at day one a baby's going to feel guilt for, for anything. Can so I I the other place I'm trying to get with it is... is you used sense, touching the hot stove. Yes. Um, which I suppose the doctors could give us a reasonably precise physiological explanation of why that happens. Right. Uh, and yet, this doesn't seem quite in the same category of physiology entirely. Let me try this language and see if it helps both of you. I don't know if it does. That you use the word tool. Conscience is a tool. Mm -hmm. and the child is born with the tool, but it's highly uncalibrated. Yeah, it's just not yeah. well informed. Yeah. So he still is living under the moral obligation to yeah. love God and love others. Yeah. He just hasn't been shaped. That was Evelyn's question. How to now, is that a tool for figuring out right and wrong, or is that a tool of having some capacity of knowing right and wrong? Uh, it's a capacity that <laughs> that that nature and nurture shapes as they get old. So some people grow up in contexts where they think that killing people as a, as a warrior is the best thing ever, and like, that's what real men do is they go kill people. Uh, others grow up thinking that it's noble to just be true to yourself and whatever sexual identity you want, that's it. Like, culture shapes how conscience functions, so that's all part of the package as okay, well. So I have like three-step question. So the yeah. second step is yeah. a newborn baby yeah. to... It seems that conscience is definitely a principal capacity into which or through which God pursues those. Mm -hmm. Would you, and, yeah, it's, a, it's because people I mean, like, feel guilt from their conscience condemning them, God can use that feeling of guilt to say you are sinful and you need someone to save you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a tool that people who evangelize need to know how it works so that they can help people feel their need for a savior and come to Christ. And the third step is yeah. in the life of the regenerated believer, yeah. what's the difference between that believer's spirit and their conscience? Okay, uh, spirit I would take is just the immaterial part of a person. So you have a material part, an immaterial part. So when you die at this stage in salvation <laughs> history, you're with the Lord in spirit, your body's in the grave. Later God will unite, reunite spirit and body in the resurrection. Uh, conscience, is part is inherent in personhood. When you're in your spirit, apart from your body in that stage, you're still fully a person, so your conscience would be with you. So I, I, w I would say it's, it's part of the person. Spirit is this immaterial versus material. You ask good questions, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> At yeah. your service. <laughs> Next. Hi, Andrew. I would say, too, thank you. We had a group of men here yesterday morning for the... Praise God. And, and Based on that, I heard about the book, and a couple of us came back. So thank you for your presentation. It was very good. Um, <clears throat> my question pertains to the role of conscience and the Holy Spirit in mm -hmm. the believer. And he here's my reference scripture, and then I'll ask a question, okay? Uh, this is John 14, uh, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you 
all things and bring to you, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And I, I guess I've always, you know, thought of, as a believer anyway, that that the Holy Spirit was active in, in, in my life when, when, when situation was, would come up, that would be the Holy Spirit prompting me or, or helping me, really not referring to my conscience. And an example would be if I go through the line at a checkout and maybe I'm given three bucks too much and I look at that money and then I, I feel like it's the Holy Spirit telling me, no, that's not your money, return that money mm -hmm. and you know, testify why you're doing it is because you're a believer, that type of thing. And I would say that was the Holy Spirit prompting me. And now, and I'm trying to recalibrate here, it, it, should it be, is that my conscience oh, okay. or is that so, the Holy Spirit? Yeah, two Incredible. parts here. Number one, the text you use, I wouldn't use for that. So John 14, he, who's the you? He will teach you all things. I think it's referring to the apostles with reference to the scripture that's uh -huh. going to come later after he goes. So I don't think that's a promise for all Christians. He, Jesus is specifically addressing his apostles who are going to write the rest of the New Testament. But what you said about how do I know whether the Holy Spirit or, or conscience speaking, the Holy Spirit uses your conscience. So I wouldn't say, well, sure. that's conscience, that's Holy Spirit. They're, they're, yeah. The Holy Spirit's working with your conscience. Yeah. Right. So if you say, I got paid three bucks too much here, mm -hmm. I need to return that, I, would, I wouldn't try to distinguish Holy Spirit and conscience there. I'd say they're working together. Would you say it's a compatibilism of, from Philippians that it is God who's at work oh, in yeah. you both to will yeah. And to do, yeah. That's so, good. so is the question then what whatever outside of that is not God's work or the Holy Spirit in your life? You know what what then is just your conscience, which would be set apart from? It's when your conscience is wrong, when your conscience is functioning wrongly. The whole, that's not Holy Spirit. Okay. When it's functioning correctly, the Holy Spirit's using it. That's how how we distinguish those. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank that's you. helpful. Good yeah. question. Thank yeah. you. Hi, my question is, when some uh, law or society in general compels us to violate our conscience, what kind of principles would you apply to, say, a decision for civil disobedience or even mm -hmm. pursuing uh, changing the laws to protect people's consciences? Yes, don't go away. Um, I want to follow up with you. So this is going to become more and more of an issue for people in America. Uh, it's already happening to schools that... Uh, different states are making laws that if you hire people who are exclusively of one view on, say, same-sex marriage, that that's discriminatory and there'll be penalties for that. That's coming. That's coming. And there, there may be, even down the road, jail time for people who preach what the New Testament teaches about that. Um, so for those sorts of issues, I value God's Word and my conscience so highly by his grace, I'd go to jail before I'd ever go against my conscience. That's easy to say right now, uh, so I think God will give grace later. But you, you, the principle is you never violate your conscience, even if it has dire consequences. And you look at the history of Christianity, there are many people who died because they couldn't go against their conscience for different issues in different societies. And we'd be in a line of, of martyrs, and that would be a good thing. Uh, do you have a specific in mind you're wondering about? Well, that's that's one of them, yeah. And the bathroom bill debates is going on. I've got, can so, you tuck right into the mic? I can't hear you. Yeah, so if you if you work in it for a company or an organization, particularly a government, that's going to force you right. to comply or you're out of here, right. you're going to lose your job, maybe right. throw you in jail. Do, sh should we start pursuing what Mississippi did, laws to protect our conscience, or do we just stand as... as yeah, so that's a, that's a wisdom issue of what, what strategy should we have in this country at this time. So some Christians are going to say, well, based on our country's founding, this is, these are the principles established, this is what religious liberty is supposed to be, this, therefore this is what we should do. That's all part of a democracy, a democratic republic, and that's a good thing. Um, but sometimes you're going to be living in a, in a situation where there's a law, and you've got to decide, do I obey it or not obey it? And if it goes against God's word, you follow the example of the apostles, we must obey God rather than men. That's it even if it means disobeying government. We obey government up until it crosses a line of saying you must do what God says not to do. Is that, you follow me? Mm -hmm. We're probably gonna come back to that. Okay, Paul, Andy. Um, so I uh, actually came up after, after Rick asked the question because it just sort of struck me. Um, maybe 
uh, the answer to the question about does a newborn, when, when does a person gain a By the way, this is Dr. Lim, the one I referred to earlier, so he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I may or may not, but, um, <laughs> but I was thinking about it in the sense that, um, I haven't read your book, but, but uh, some of the words that you use, that conscience is like an instrument, it's like mm -hmm. a tool, it's like a, you know, something like that, it's a functional thing. And, um, and there's, you know, obviously it's a, it's a spiritual and a physical thing. We got the Holy Spirit thing, but you also have uh, physical aspects of it. You have to be able to hear, right? You have to have the physical organs to have that and all that entails. It starts from the level of the eardrums all the way into the brain where, you know, anything in there, you need to have those capabilities. So, so then it sort of uh, struck me, just like taking hearing, you'd say, um, or, or actually uh, think about any sort of function. So does a newborn have a, a conscience? I guess the question would be then, it seems to me, uh, does a um, embryo have a conscience? You know, does a newborn, and, and I would argue that it's all there because from the moment of conception, we have an individual human being. Now, all the functions that God has placed on that um, child now has not manifest yet, yeah. hasn't developed to that yeah. point yet. You don't have the organs of hearing, right. you know, that's developed yet, um, but it's all there. And the fact that we can't see them, you know, um, doesn't mean that it's not there. And what I mean by that is uh, there's this notion in, in science that whatever we know now is all there is to know. I call it chronological arrogance. Uh, every, everyone at every time has suffered from this. <laughs> we always think that what we know now mm -hmm. is all there is to know. Mm -hmm. So we know, to some, you know, we know this about a, a child in terms of development and stuff like that. Mm -hmm we say, well, there's no brain here, it doesn't feel whatever, and stuff like that. Maybe, or maybe, or maybe 200 years from now, 300 years from now, we're gonna have some instrument that we can see this thing that, to us, just looks like the single cell organism, and we, nothing's differentiated. You know, maybe we're gonna, there'll be a time where we're gonna look at that cell and be like, oh yeah, there. You know, that's where everything is. So, I guess I would say, is this the right way to think about this? It's not because some, I think we, have a tendency to fall into, you know, once, once a child is outside the womb, is able to hear and all this stuff, then we start thinking about, like, what do they have and stuff. But I w it seems to me that it's there as soon as at the moment of conception, um, that it's all there. We just can't, you know, it just hasn't been developed and manifest. I don't know. Is that? Yes. So I, by calling it a capacity, it's there, but it's some, in some people, it's not, they're not developed yet for it to be functioning or there's something that's broken about them that results in it not working. Right, exactly, yes. and it's a nature-nurture thing. What yeah. you're talking about, interestingly, same thing with hearing or any other function. Yeah. You know, it could have all been there, or it could have been genetically it's not there, and it never will develop in a certain way, or something happens and disrupts something later on. And I think the same thing could be probably said. So I, I think, I don't know if the nature of the question, but this idea, is there some moment that something, something spiritual happens at some point later, and, and it seems to me that it's all there from the beginning and develops, just like anything else develops. Yes, my point, there's a, there is a point though where you start to feel guilt when you hadn't before. Would you agree with that? Right, in yeah. the same sense that a, um, uh, words don't mean anything, as far as we know, to a newborn. At some point, words start meaning something. Right? So, so it's, it's something that is developing you know, over time, and, but it's not, I guess what I mean is it's not like, I don't think that there's, it doesn't seem like there's a time where the Holy Spirit says, okay, now I'm gonna infuse into this child. It seems like it's a development sort of thing. And I, and I, don't, think, and I don't think it's a dichotomy between physical and spiritual. Because the soul, I think, uh, probably scripturally you agree, at the moment of conception is the time of ensoulment. Mm -hmm. You know, there's controversy through the years. Yeah, I agree. Is there ensoulment later? And so it's always physical, it's always spiritual. Even, even the things that appear to be physical, I would argue, is, is spiritual as well, including the ability to hear. You know, we're not Gnostic. Not, there aren't physical things and okay. spiritual things.
Anyway, I don't know. Thanks, Dr. Lim. If that Thank makes, you. If that I is really true. appreciate learning from people about stuff I don't know as much about. So I love you. Thank you. Yeah. I yeah. wonder if we could linger with Paul just yeah. a little bit longer. Yeah. If you're willing to tell the narrative of your story, this is about conscience, I think. Here you are, a missionary physician living in a culture where you're not making much money. You're a, you're a missionary, a global partner. And then you come back to the States for that. We don't need that part of the narrative, but you come back to the States and now you're able to afford a different kind of a car. You remember telling me about that story? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Can you talk about that and what, what, you, what your conscience had to do with the kind of money that you were oh. now making? Were you feeling guilty when you came back and you had more money? Uh, no. Um, it was, uh, I can't remember what, what was the context about the car story. Well, you're, I think it was your mother or someone who thought you should be driving a nicer car now that you make more money back oh, in the States. Right. Right, right, right. And I, and I was, uh, we, had, we had this old car that we actually left and before we went to Ethiopia and, and then when we came back and it was really not running all that well, but it was running. And, um, you know, I thought it was fine. Oh, I remember the context of it. Okay, it's this whole idea of... Um, My, 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 my natural sinful nature is going to want more and better and luxurious and all this stuff. I, I don't, I, I think that what, what we're talking about is I, I don't really, my main problem is that not that I have, um, uh, wait, how do I, how do I phrase this? How do I phrase it? My main well, I was interested in what was going on in you because yeah. you had to make calculations when when you're driving a certain kind of car and somebody else wanted you to drive a car at a different level of automotive uh, finery right. and you were having to explain to yourself what your decisions were going to be about what kind of car to drive. Right. I'm sorry. I'm, I haven't talked this through <laughs> to give you a good answer. I think it's Go this idea down. that... Yeah. <laughs> it, was this, it was this idea that I, I uh, wanted to... I wanted, I, I, I just want to do, uh, you know, kind of wartime living and do that, and, and I was happy to do that. And yet, um, I was getting sort of pressure yeah. to, like, you know, have nicer stuff because I can, uh, simply because I can afford it. And I think I was saying that that's, that's not what I need. I don't need people to, like, encourage me to, like, spend more money because I would have that natural tendency. And I prefer, you know, what I need is more people saying, yes, do the wartime lifestyle, not do it the other way, but I don't know if that has anything to do with the conscience. I, I do have a comment about that issue, yeah. though. Um, yeah. Some people who really drink deeply at, at John Piper's message of wartime mentality, wartime yeah. lifestyle, can feel sometimes, not always, but sometimes can feel oversensitive about anything that's not necessary. So, uh, just an example. Uh, I know someone who really, really uh, believed and, 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 and followed John Piper's, John Piper's teaching in that area for good reasons and then felt guilty that uh, she lived in a home that was bigger than she ever dreamed she'd live in. And she's using it all the time for hospitality, for, you know, with her children, and just, it's, just, it's a revolving door to just helping people and come in. And it's not extravagant, but it's bigger than necessary. And she's just wrestling. Do I... Do I need to repent for having this house that's bigger than I need, even though I'm using it to, to serve other people? And she, she asked me, and I said, well, uh, the heart is complex, and I don't think you can do anything without sinning to some degree, but what are your motivations for this? If your motivations are to serve God with this and not to flaunt wealth and not to indulge pleasures, but it's, it's to enjoy gifts from God and serve other people with it, and you can serve people better by having a little bit more space then I don't think that's a, a thing you should feel guilt for. So are you saying, Andy, maybe, that a person's conscience could be informed in part by wartime lifestyle as, as articulated by John Piper, and their conscience could also be refined by Joe Rigney's Things of Earth book yeah. that talks about enjoying the things yes. of Earth. Yes. And so there's a, there's, we could live in a tension. Yeah. I was, Joe Rigney just said the other day he, that he wrote the Things of Earth to correct not like John Piper was wrong, but to correct what some people thought was a necessary implication of what he taught. And John Piper wrote the foreword of that book, so he agrees with Joe. Uh, 
So sometimes people need to hear, hear more Piper, sometimes they might need to hear Rigney on that. So do you think yeah. there are people then who can take a good thing, drive a stake there, and then absolutize, yeah. yes. and that's a mistake for their conscience? Yes, yes. I think that, that was actually kind of the nature of that conversation. Okay. And, you know, I, I, I understand the excesses and wrong thinking that can happen. And, it, and it's just like anything else. It can become a workspace, merit-based justification or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess for me, I think during that conversation, my tendency is, is not to underdo it. It's to overdo it. So I would prefer, I, what I need more of is, is, is having John say maximize your use for the, mm -hmm. you know, for the war that we have because my tendency is to take the Queen Elizabeth and take it as the luxury ship <laughs> rather than the Queen Elizabeth as the, you know, and that's troop transport. Says. That's my, yeah. that's my, that's my risk and that's my um, inclinations more so. So that's, that's why I just preferred, you know, um, um, I, I'll fall off the wagon in that way and more likely. That's why I think that was... Self-awareness is very helpful there. Michael. Oh, Jane. Hi, thank you. Um, I wrote, um, bringing nature, nurture, and the flesh, that's going to be the soul, the mind, will, and the emotions, and the body, into a clear conscience through the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't this be called a circumcision of the heart? Okay, so the language circumcision of the heart in the New Testament is, an, is a metaphor for what an, another term, regeneration, where the Holy Spirit takes someone who's spiritually dead and, and gives life to that person. That's circumcision of the heart. Um, are you saying is that identical to what you just described? Well, I would think that the, the, that would sear the conscience. Would sear that the... would guess for me because it would change your, your outlook it the would sear, okay, the, let me, maybe not let's, sear is maybe not the right word, but it would definitely change your flesh, change yourself. Maybe transform your, your conscience. Soul, transform, transform it, Transform, yes. yeah. yeah. Transform your mind, transform yes. everything. So when God regenerates a person, when the Holy Spirit regenerates a person, uh, their conscience is going to function differently because the Holy Spirit's going to be working through it now. Yes. Regardless of nature, regardless of nurture. Well... Yes, and the nature and nurture is going to be part of the package. You, ha you have to spend your whole life uh, thinking, what do I do with this garden? Let's do the garden metaphor. My conscience is a garden. There are weeds all over this garden, and there are things that should be planted in this garden that aren't there. What goes, what stays, what's missing? That's a lifelong process. Just like the Apostle Paul, for example. When God saved the Apostle Paul, in his conscience prior to his conversion was he could kill Christians with a clear conscience. He thought weeds. he was honoring God that way. That needed to go. He also had in his conscience, I can't eat certain foods because of Jewish law. That had to go. And that was his nurture. Uh, yes, yes. So that is a, a lifelong, to change the metaphor, calibration of align my, my conscience with the standard of the word of God. And that's something that Christians need to do even after regeneration. But yes, I'm with you. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Michael. Okay, so in Acts, you already referenced this. Um, Peter says he's not going to eat certain meats, and God says, you know, don't, don't say what I have said is clean is unclean, and then, you know, goes to bat with him three times, and then Peter eats. And then Paul in Corinthians encourages a mature or maybe we'll say stronger brother, right, with the conscience to not, um, what would you say, uh, 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 try to get a, a, a brother with a weaker conscience to um, neglect his conscience on the matter of food, mm -hmm. food worship or food sacrifice to idols. So we got God saying, eat because uh, I say this food is clean. Um, and then Paul saying, uh, if, you feed, if your conscience is telling you that you can't eat this because this food was sacrificed to idols, then don't eat it. So at what point um, do we encourage people to recalibrate in that sense? If it's, a neutral, if it's a neutral issue, do we even need to recalibrate? So if we go back to the example of the woman in makeup, 
I mean, is, could that potentially be a negative thing if someone says, you do know that the Bible doesn't say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can't wear makeup. So go ahead, that's fine, even if her conscience mm -hmm. condemns her for doing that. Uh, should she just say, you know what, my conscience condemns me, so I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to let okay. that one lie? I'm with you. Or, you know what I'm saying? Yep, yep. This is a really how, important question. How do we question. work through that? So, when you, when you think through this issue, you, uh, one, the main text to, to run to is, is Romans 14. Mm -hmm. So, there are three issues in that chapter where the Christians disagree with each other. One is regarding whether they can eat meat, mm -hmm. and it, just for the record, it's the weak ones who eat only vegetables. Uh, another issue is uh, <laughs> drinking wine, and another one is observing the Sabbath and holy days. Mm -hmm. So those are the three particular issues in Romans 14. Now, if I were the apostle writing a letter to the Romans and, and kind of just helping with this dispute, I would say something like, well, theologically, here's the correct view. So if you have a theologically incorrect view, which is what the weaker people are in that passage, if you have a theologically incorrect view on something, change your theology and don't, don't call sin what is not sin and enjoy it to the glory of God. Next issue. Like, that, that's how I would think. But that's not what Paul does. Paul is not concerned primarily with everyone becoming strong, theologically correct on every issue. Though I think his terms weak and strong imply that that's a good thing to do. His main concern is that on, on issues where it's not orthodoxy that's at stake, but consciences. The main thing is that you don't encourage people to go against their consciences, and you live together in unity and love each other in those differences. That's what he's concerned about. So that's, I think, how we should, in our relations with other Christians, when our consciences clash, is if you have a theologically correct view and someone else has a theologically incorrect view but not heretical, your main, your, your main task in serving that person is not, I need to kind of convince you to take my view. It's... I need to love you in our differences. That's, that's Romans 14. Now, is there ever a time for talking about why do you think that? Yes, there is. But you've got to do it really carefully because there's a way to encourage someone, to pressure someone to go against their conscience mm -hmm. that can harm them so badly. So in a, in a church context, it's often there's a church culture where everybody does one particular thing and someone comes in from an outside context and it, they feel pressured to do that just to go along with everyone else and their conscience doesn't allow them at that point, that can be really dangerous. So we need to go out of our way to be sensitive to other people's consciences. It, follow back here if, if, if you have questions on that. Does that make sense? No, nope. yeah, I think, I think that's... Well, well yeah. let me ask the, for yeah. this clarification then. Are you distinguishing between a conscience that's fully persuaded and a conscience that's entertaining something and maybe partially settled Oh, yeah. Or, or yeah. is partially settled an oxymoron? No, no. There are people who are, they're, they're not sure. They're, they're wavering. And, and I think one of the principles in Romans 14 is let everyone be fully convinced in their own mind. Get a conviction. So you need to get a conviction and not just be waffling your whole life. But there is, when you said fully persuaded, there, there's a type of person who uh, is convinced that they are absolutely right on a, on a third level issue and they want to tell you that if you disagree with them, you're wrong and you're offending them, therefore you shouldn't do it. So, I'll give an example. I'll try to pick one that's not controversial here. Uh, <laughs> let's say someone at Bethlehem thinks that it is sinful for a man to attend a Sunday worship gathering without a tie on. Okay. <clears throat> oh, there we go. All right. Um, and then they're just, well, let's make it, let's say they think the preacher must have a tie on. They're not, they, they can't support a preacher who doesn't wear a tie on when he preaches. There are people like this. Maybe at Bethlehem, I don't know. And what do you do with someone like that? Do you say, well, I, I, I've got to wear a tie because I don't want to offend that guy. No, no. Uh, so the, the Romans 14 talks about causing someone to stumble. It doesn't mean that there's someone with a, a conviction really strong and you, you disagree with them and that offends them. If, if that was the case, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't do anything because mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, quote the NIV or the ESV and someone's going to wish I quoted the, the KJV or I'm going to mention something about my wife homeschooling my daughters and someone's going to say, why aren't they in this private school or why aren't they going to public school or whatever. There's going to be people who have different convictions. You, you're going to offend everyone in some way. Uh, where they disagree with you. So you can't live that way. W what the principle is, is if someone 
has a theologically incorrect view on an issue and, and you encourage them to go against their conscience, that's causing them to stumble. Where you, you take them aside and say, all right, let's do this and don't think through the issue. That's, that's the issue. Not if they are, you're, you're not in any way leading them to sin by what you do. So does that distinction help a little bit? Yeah, totally. So maybe I'll do one follow-up question. Yeah. Um, if it is one of those issues, is there a, a, a time at which you just say, I'm going to let this one lie. You know what? I know you're free in Christ to wear makeup, and I've tried to talk to you about it before, but you're just, yeah. you still feel like your conscience is condemning you, and so, you know, do you, do you just stop at that Absolute, point? Or? You, yes. So the, one of the examples in the book that J.D. Crowley gives is when he went to Cambodia, um, the Khmer Rouge had just uh, occurred, and there's this just devastation all over the place, and there are people who are coming out of paganism, just becoming Christians, and they have a primary musical instrument they use to worship God called gongs. There are five different shaped gongs, and one's like three feet in diameter. And it sounds really weird to Western ears, but that's what they use. And when J.D. arrived, he encouraged them to use their instruments to worship God with the kind of music they, they use, and they wouldn't do it because they associated gongs with paganism. They wouldn't touch them. But about, I think, 10 years or so later, after J.D. had said along the way, you know what, I'm not going to force you to do this if it's against your conscience, but just remember, music is a gift from God, instruments are a gift from God, just because you use them in a wrong way doesn't mean they're necessarily wrong, but I'm not going to force you to, and just let it go. And years later, the tribal leaders got together and said, we're ready. And they had a gong day where they, they used their gongs to the glory of God, and now that's their main instrument they use. And you can watch it in the latest dispatches from the front video. It it's, features Cambodia. It features J.D. Crowley, the co-author of this book, and it's got gongs in there. It tells part of the story. Now, it's a good example of, of someone giving people space to calibrate their conscience on an issue. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Christina? All right. So my question, I think, follows nicely. Just with this patience with other people and, yeah. and giving time to calibrate, um, should, you, should you think about being patient with yourself as you're calibrating your conscience? Maybe you should what? Should you think about so being patient with yourself yeah. as you're calibrating your conscience? Yeah. So thinking, like, I need to pull this weed out of the garden mm -hmm. of my conscience, but, like, maybe I'm... Maybe I'm not even like halfway there. Like I really do feel convicted that this is okay. The Bible says this is okay, um, but there's there's like a fear and or an anxiousness as you approach doing it. Mm -hmm. um, it. This is kind of I guess like it's not. Well, maybe it is a how to, but almost a when to. It's like do you kind of back down and say okay, like I'm not going to do it yet because I'm not ready. Or how I have kind of been thinking about it is like it. It relates to the measure of faith you're given in the moment to act in faith. Yeah. The principle in Romans 14 is whatever is not done in faith is sinful. Mm -hmm. So if you can't do it with, with good faith, your conscience is going to condemn you, don't do it. You just back down. And that might take time. Okay. Here's a really practical example. So I grew up in, well, first Mormon, but then God saved my family, and we were conservative evangelical Southern Baptists. Mm -hmm. Then we were part of a fundamentalist group, which are good godly people. We love them. One, in, in that time period, uh, my godly Christian leaders, I write about this a little bit in the book, is they, they taught, some of them taught, that certain musical styles, you're a musician, so you know this, um, say that the anapestic rock beats, or the one, two, three, four beats, the two and four, are uh, communicating inherently, in all times, and all cultures, a sinful kind of sensuality. Have you ever heard that argument? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, these were my spiritual leaders, and I was young at the time, just in high school, and I okay, I want to be a good Christian and follow my leaders. So I, I went, went with that, as well as other things. Like they said, if you scooped when you sung or different kind of ways of yeah. being breathy or yeah. like they thought that's what the world does, that's therefore evil, that inherently communicates something and we don't want to do that. And the, they have the best intentions. It, we want to be holy people and not be worldly people. And uh, later, a little later in life, um, I came to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and it was in a different context. It wasn't, it wasn't Bob Jones University. And um, there's some cognitive dissonance of I'm, I'm rubbing shoulders with people who love Jesus. They're got, some of them are evidently more godly than I am, but they do stuff that my cultures, my subcultures in the past said were sinful. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. and, and that is part of what caused me to study conscience about 10 years ago mm -hmm. is why is why is this happening? Why are Christians disagreeing on these sorts of issues? And on this particular issue of music, what I did is this, it, it wasn't truth inside the Bible that changed my view, because we all agree, the Bible says be holy, don't be worldly. 
it was truth outside the Bible about what is music, what's the nature of music, what are, how do associations work, what does it inherently communicate or not communicate, how does it work with cultures. It was studying that in conjunction with the Bible that led me to think in good conscience some musical styles might not be best in certain contexts, but they're not inherently evil in all times and all cultures. And that took a good maybe two years for me mm -hmm. to work through, mm -hmm. and I, I'm glad I didn't rush it. So that's Thank an example. You. Thank you. Let me just follow up there. Um, earlier, you emphasized the importance of community, Christian community, your wife and other saints yeah. who helped shape your conscience right. in good ways. And here you said there was a subculture right. that was shaping you in some unhelpful ways. Yeah. So would you be willing to um, make any comments on the prevalent pop Christian culture these days to say, here's some ways in which our current culture might be unhelpful to our consciences. Uh, my reputation on faculty is that I am the least qualified to talk about pop culture. <laughs> so, I, uh, um, uh, maybe give me a give me a hint. What do you? What do I'm, you I'm not hinting okay, for anything. Okay. I just, I just. Uh, do when you walk into a. When you walk into a Christian bookstore, there's some stuff oh, there, and okay. you think, oh, okay. man, this is not going to be helpful to, to making Christ-like Christians. Yeah, this is a, an emotion-based, feel-good, practical, not how to glorify God with Wait your... a minute. If I feel good, that doesn't mean that I should go ahead and do it? <laughs> Correct. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just felt like doing that uh, right there. There's so much that would come to mind. Is this, this, uh, okay, yeah. let us have a little um, of it. A very... Surface level, hmm. not study the text, trace the argument of text, but just help me have a better marriage, help me have a better job, help me. It's, it's all practic. It's no, how do I know God better? How do I understand hmm. what, how he's revealed himself to us? That gets to the root of knowing your heart and knowing God. That's how Calvin's Institute starts, know yourself, know God, and then go from there. So I'd want to go deeper to do heart surgery and then work yeah. out from there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You talked about um, the example of the bookstore and the books that address like surface level issues and um, parenting, marriage, how can I make my I'm marriage not against work? those kind of books, by the way. Yeah, the right. good ones. There are good ones on parenting and marriage, but go ahead. And <laughs> my question is, because it comes up a lot in my mind, is what is the place for gospelly motive, uh, gospelly motivated and immensely practical sermons that give actual applications that someone can say, oh, I can see how I can do this. Mm -hmm. Because um, so many um, applications I've seen and heard are, you need to think of it yourself. And we're not going to give you any guidance or any help to mm -hmm. do that. Because we don't want to infringe on your liberty. Mm -hmm. But what is the place for actual examples and guidance on practical applications of gospel lessons. Yeah, that's part of contextualizing the Bible to your congregation. So if you're preaching or teaching and you have an issue like don't steal, you need to know your context to know where are people stealing in this culture. Maybe you need to talk about what do you do with your musical files. Ooh, maybe people are feeling pangs of guilt right there. Or are you, are you sharing illegally videos and music and other media? That's stealing. Or you, so that kind of application, are you stealing from your employer? Are you stealing the, from the government with your taxes? Are, that kind of preaching and teaching is necessary when you explain the Bible. You, wanna, you want people to apply what the Scripture says. So I'm all for that, and that's important. Yeah, that's good. Just to follow up on the practical yeah. thing, just how, how can a person, just their moodiness affect the, the liveliness of their conscience, or caffeine, or... Alcohol can, mm -hmm. can help enliven or deaden mm -hmm. your conscience. Well, I wouldn't know as much about caffeine or alcohol. i uh, never been drunk, but I've been told, actually Paul tells us this, that drunkenness makes you act in a way that is irrational. It is, you're not controlling your senses. And I would deduce from that that your conscience is not functioning, functioning like it would otherwise. So there, you can have a, an, an emotional state or an inebriated state where you're out of control. 
and you should be filled with the Spirit instead. It, it is, uh, I, I think, in a different category. The, you know, don't be drunk. Yeah. Clear. Don't be tired. That's not a command. Oh man! But if you're really tired, can't your conscience just kind of peter out on you? Yeah. You, you, yeah. I know this right now. I've got I've got mono right now, and I've had some other stuff going on in the last several months, and in my accountability reports that I've shared with my brothers. Uh, a few times in the last few weeks, I've had to say, on this day, I, I snapped at my wife and, and girls. I think it was related to the medication one day, but I don't want that to be an excuse. It showed that there's evil in my heart. But there's a correlation between being tired, for me at least, and not being patient. So we'll yeah. get to you, we'll get yeah. to you, Anthony, here, but just one more follow-up. Yeah. You used the word excuse. Yeah. How do we do war on our excuse-making? Because I think we're a race of excuse makers. Yeah. Um, think of your heart. This is a friend of mine has this illustration like a tea bag, and when you put it in hot water, it shows what's in your heart. So you say, no, the, the hot water showed, showed what was there. No, the hot water was just showing what's in your heart. It, it's, it, it's you. Don't blame it on the hot water. The problem's at the tea bag. Yeah. Ouch. Forgive me for rising twice during the meeting, but um, what... Is your conscience gentlemen... troubling you about that? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. As long as if you forgive me, I think that's assuaging my conscience. Uh, what one of the gentlemen said about civil disobedience just triggered for me a really big, crucial question for Christians about conscience. That, you know, there's laws that would require you to act against your conscience by forcing you to do something. And like you said, you know, we, it's pretty clear biblically you don't have to obey that law. You know, a law that conflicts with the law of God is no law at all, to quote it. But then there are a bunch of things where people feel that they have the right to do them or they're free to do them, and yet, even though their conscience is clear, there are certain laws or community life statements at a seminary or a college mm -hmm. that say, we don't want you to do these things. Mm -hmm. And I think I've run into a lot of Christians who think, well, if I feel fine in my conscience to do it, I can do it. I'm free to do it. So... Would you distinguish being forced to act against your conscience versus refraining from doing something you think is okay for you to do Absolutely. because there's a law or Absolutely. some Absolutely. Here's a good example. So I have many good friends who still teach at Bob Jones University mm -hmm. in Greenville, South Carolina. It's a good school. And they're godly men. And you might assume, oh, they teach at Bob Jones, therefore, but you don't know. You don't know their hearts. I know some of these guys really well, and they could teach at Bethlehem College and Seminary. They're, 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 just because they're in a certain context, don't assume you know what's going on in their heart. For many of these guys, they are contextualizing to serve a certain group of people, and they're giving up freedoms that they know they have in order to help people, and I think that's honorable. Just because you have the freedom to do something doesn't mean you need to do it. That, there's a whole chapter on this thing. It's chapter five in the book, using the example of Paul, you know, 1 Corinthians 9, the whole point of understanding your, con a point of understanding your conscience well is so that you can flex on certain issues. If, if your conscience says that something that is not inherently wrong is wrong, you can't flex on it. But if your conscience tells you it's not inherently wrong, you could do it or not do it, then you can flex in certain contexts. So take, um, uh, let's take drinking alcohol in the Southern Baptists. Uh, Drinking alcohol is not inherently sinful. Otherwise, Jesus is sinful. Uh, he, he turned water to wine. That doesn't mean we should all drink wine. So there are people who make really good arguments for not drinking wine in certain contexts in order to, to help people and to help themselves, uh, not fall themselves. And I, I think that's honorable. But to make that a rule, that's different. So uh, friends of mine who are in contexts where their institutions say no alcohol, and they agree to go by that so they can serve in that context, hats off to them. A little different when, the, when a church makes that a rule. When a church says to be a member of this church, you have to follow these rules and they're not Bible rules, that's a problem. And, and John Piper saw that when he first came to Bethlehem in the mm -hmm. early 80s. Yeah. And he doesn't drink alcohol, but he changed that rule. With, he helped lead that change. The church changed, uh, affirmed it for that very reason. And I, I hat off to John Piper for, even though he has a, a conviction about that personally, knowing I don't need to make my convictions church-wide across the board. What should be church-wide is what is clear in Scripture. 
So uh, church would be different from, say, an educational institution in that, in that regard. Is that helping answer? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, yeah. that's spot on. And it, there'd be a difference between saying, I don't, I don't have to obey this law because it's requiring me to do something wrong, right. versus saying, well, I'm, I'm part of Southern Baptist, but I'm, I'm not going to abide by their policy yeah. because I don't think God binds my conscience about drinking. Yeah, that's just insubordination. If, if yeah. you think it's a bad rule, go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Just from expectation management and process for this, I'm aiming for about 15 more minutes here. So if you're wondering how long is this going to go or how short is this going to be cut off, um, about 15 more minutes. So. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to ask my question or phrase it, um, but just an issue that I have and trying to figure out how should I inform my conscience on this issue. Um, but it just become more personal at work in um, how to love my coworkers and be a good employee and be a witness for the gospel in that context. And I work as a nurse um, in the recovery room. So I take care of patients before and after surgery. And this came up a while ago um, because they do abortions at my hospital. And, Mm. um, you know, approaching my manager and saying, I, like, it makes me physically ill and angry. Like, my conscience says I, I can't take care of these women after they do this. Um, And I hope graciously was able to say that. And I feel like even in talking with non-believers on um, that issue, there's still some level of understanding that God has given them a conscience. He's put his law in their mind in some manner. Um, And so, you know, the commandment, do not kill. And so even if we're not exactly on the same page, I feel like we can rationalize a little bit on that topic, um, but then now taking care of transgender patients, women coming in and wanting to become men, and ha- having to take care of a few before and after, and just to clarify, sure. you're not operating on them. You're not no. doing the abortion. You're not doing the transgender no. surgery. You're helping them recover and yeah. pre- prepare so and recover. Preparing them for having it done and taking care. I've never thought about this. Okay, keep going. Um, and so I hadn't either and um, being kind of thrown into that situation and like how do I care for this person and honestly with those patients I don't I feel more like weeping like the sense of anger Mm -hmm. that comes up with abortion where I I can't do it I don't feel that with them and so I don't know how much of a battle I should fight on this yet like what's God's wisdom on this and how can I love them and care for them yeah. and still make a stand? Because when I did express some preference, I'd rather not take care of them. It was, but well, you're not treating them as a person. And, right. You know, so. Okay, this is, here's, here's how I would, I'd address this. I'd want to talk, I'd start by just informing my conscience about truth outside the Bible. So I'd want to talk to people like Paul Lim and Matt Anderson and other doctors and say, okay, help me understand this medically what's going on here, what's your perspective, Christian doctors, mm-hmm. help me here, and, and see what they say first. That would mm-hmm. be step one for me. Uh, if I had to just share my opinion right now, there's a difference between actually performing an abortion and helping someone recover. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's sin to mm-hmm. help someone recover. You're actually, you could be helpful and, and actually be a tool in God's hand because mm-hmm. that's that's when Satan will be condemning them most for the abortion afterwards, and you could mm. come alongside. Maybe God could use you to see the error of their ways and come to Christ. Uh, so that could be a good thing to be able to help them afterwards. Yeah. Um, so this is an issue where if your conscience says you can't do it, you can't do it. I don't know necessarily if it means you can't do it because you'd be sinning. I need mm. to know more. How's that? <laughs> that didn't help you, did I? I <laughs> that's how I'd start thinking through it. But I don't think... I, like, I think Bethlehem would need to do church discipline for someone who mm-hmm. had an abortion and thought that it was not a problem and they didn't repent mm-hmm. of it and they, they would encourage others to have abortion. Like, that's just a good thing. No, that, we would say that's murder. We can't do that. I don't see Bethlehem coming after, that's the wrong word, uh, rebuking, co- confronting, and church disciplining someone for helping someone recover after abortion. Mm-hmm. That's two different categories. Mm-hmm. That's, that's my reflex. But, again, I'd want to talk to doctors first. You're looking at me funny. What I? No, I'm, okay. well, what I want to say about uh, this is another ma- management of expectations is 
when we adjourn here in a few minutes, if you've got a personal dilemma like this and you want to interact with Andy about that, you're welcome to do it. Although, I want to say, he also has mono and he's trying to guard his margins a little bit, so we don't want to keep him here all night. But I know his spirit. He's got a very pastoral spirit. He'd be willing to interact with you about your personal crisis or your, the tension that you're living with. So thank you for posing that very good question. Really good question. I'm still sitting back here trying to figure out how to formulate it, but um, you mentioned at the beginning that conscious is a capacity um, when you were trying to explain with infants. Um, so personally, obviously, you don't know me from a grain of salt, but um, as one prone to more introspection and thinking a lot more about a lot of different things that um, some may or may not be thinking about, how... Uh, it, it's, going to, it's going to sound weird, but is there a cap, like a cap on a capacity for conscience? Because I even think about areas like I shop at Old Navy, and I don't think about the ethical things that are happening um, that may be happening overseas that to have those clothes be manufactured in a way that I can get it for five bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't personally necessarily feel convicted about that, mm-hmm. but there's little, I mean... I think I'm asking this question in the context of the culture that we're living in now, of mm-hmm. this oversaturation of like, you should do this, how dare you do this, here are five ways you can accomplish this by 30, or whatever it may be. Um, so does that make sense in the, in the context that I'm asking, like is there a cap on how much you should be conscious of? As a, like do, do we have the capacity to see everything that we should have a conscience about? Okay, I think I understand your question. <laughs> yeah, we, our conscience should be functioning according to the word of God, which means it's going to condemn us for sins. And if it's not condemning us for certain sins, it needs to be functioning more. And we need to cultivate it to do that. We live in a culture that picks and chooses what people should feel conviction for. So the culture right now wants you to feel convicted because you bought fair trade coffee or because you bought some product that is is taking advantage of people somewhere else in the world. But, But if you have a conviction in another area, like the Bible says this about marriage, and you affirm that, then you're discriminatory. So, like, there's a, the culture has a set of do this, don't do this. So, we're, we're going up against that. And that's one of the challenges for Christians is to cultivate our conscience, calibrate our conscience according to the Bible and not according to culture. Hmm. And when you say, is there a cap on it? The, the only cap is, is Scripture. Um, is that, you can come back if you have a follow-up to that. Is that helping at all? I don't. I just think, okay. I think on top of that, I would say, how would you, um, how would you advise the more introspective type to not spiral about it? Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. I'm not an introspective type, so I don't have the personal experience sure. with this, but I know some who are, and their proclivity is to second-guess everything they do, to you know, dive into the depths of their sinful heart and wallow and feel self-pity. And uh, what I would want to um, exhort them to do is don't overdo that. Remember uh, the song, When Satan Tempts Me to Despair? I like to change it to conscience. When conscience tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just was satisfied to, uh, to pardon him. No, to pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. And that, that's where I go when I feel condemned, when my conscience condemns me. So if you're introspective, you need to go to the cross. Mm-hmm. That's where to go. Otherwise, it will be a tool from Satan to lead you otherwise. That's exactly what he wants to do. I've heard people say that when you're, well, like an example, of when a woman gets an abortion, uh, the, the happiest voice in her head is, is Satan saying, you're doing the right thing, suppressing the conscience. And as soon as the abortion happens, he lets that conscience go and condemns, it, condemns the lady. Um, so we want to go to the cross and not let Satan use our consciences uh, against us like that. Boy, I'm, I don't feel like I answered your question well, but there we go. It's still helpful. Okay. Well, let me follow there. Yeah. You, talk, you used the word suppress. Yeah. In, in Romans 1, we're yeah. taught that mm-hmm. the wrath of God is against those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The unrighteousness of those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. 
So this is a question about evangelism. How should we um, love with the gospel people who are going to suppress the truth? They're, they're, if I can use this language, they're, they are conscience squelchers in their own life. Right. How, do we get, how do we help them? How do we serve them to awaken to what's true about the way, the truth, and the life? Well, we can't do it. What we can do is say, here's what God has said in Scripture, and pray that God, through His Spirit, would waken spiritually dead people. We can't do anything. Yeah. One more, Michael. Yeah. My conscience is not troubling me at all for being up here for a second time. I just wanted to <laughs> let everybody know that. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to vote on you uh, to be an elder next Sunday, and um, Pastor Sam here just said you have a very pastoral heart, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to to pastor us before you're officially voted in. Um, could you tell us um, some things that you see in our culture today having to do with entertainment and how uh, the people of God and probably just people in general should recalibrate their conscience uh, for entertainment? I know that's a tough question. No, Pastor it's, not, it's a good asking question. It, but yeah. I would just love to know, especially as a millennial, you know, we're just knee deep in this stuff. And... Uh, I might be a weaker brother on this issue in the sense that maybe I'm not as theologically accurate as I should be, but on the issue of entertainment, it, I am very strict with myself, and I, I'm trying to be generous with others. Well, I have to wrestle with not looking down on other people for their entertainment choices. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at that, but I hope I'm not timid in my, my teaching and preaching. We don't own a TV. I don't remember the last time I went to a movie theater. It's not because I think it's wrong. It's just it's more expensive and you can't pause it to go to the bathroom. But anyway, but it's, and you have to pay for babysitting. Um, but my point is I don't, I don't take in a lot of, of, of this kind of media. I don't, I don't have Netflix, all that. And if I, when I hear glimpses of what fellow people at Bethlehem do, sometimes I wonder, so when do, you, when do you study the Bible? When do you memorize the Bible? When do you pray? When do you serve other people? Sounds like you just watch Netflix every night. What, I, I don't know, but it, like, how do you know all this stuff about meaning? To what sounds like to me is meaningless stuff. So uh, I try not to be judgmental. See, you feel that, that uh, tension? <laughs> um, but I'd want to have the freedom to challenge people That's to good. not waste That's their good. life. So there's freedom, in, in, in there's a freedom you can have of what entertainment choices you make. You don't want to take a spiritual bath after entertaining yourself. So if, if you feel like you have to take a spiritual bath, you probably shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but in the range of what's acceptable, you can also ask the question, is it best? Mm -hmm. is, is this overrunning your life? Of It's, it's mm -hmm. not inherently sin, but it's, it's taking up time that robs you from doing more edifying, more valuable things. Again, I'm giving you a bend of my personality. Uh, what I need people to preach to me is take rest. Mm -hmm. Rest is a good thing. Uh, relax with your family. I, I, I'm a go, go, go guy person, so that, that kind of like how Paulin was talking about, he wants to, he, he feels like he needs the wartime mentality. I need to hear rest, rest, rest. So this is coming out of my personality. So uh, maybe that part of me is what you're going to hear uh, in sermons and teaching is that maybe you're entertaining yourself too much. Maybe you should cut back and Yet, I don't want to judge people for their choices if they're not inherently sinful. I could say a lot more there. Is that what, kind That's of what you're good. wondering? It's good. It's good. Yes. You give us okay. principles. Okay. All right. Let's take what, this. This will be the last question, okay. and I'll ask it. Uh, J.D. Crowley, who wrote this with you, is not here. So use your imagination. If he were here on this panel, what would he want to make sure got said tonight? Oh, boy. He's... One of the most gracious people I know. He's just a loving, kind, gracious man. And he would probably go out of his way to affirm you for coming and encourage you to maintain a good conscience. Um, but my guess is that given his life, most of his life being in other cultures, especially in Asian cultures, would encourage you not to be so rigid in your convictions, unnecessarily rigid, that it prohibits you from flexing to advance the gospel in other cultures, even in your church culture, even in other cultures in America, and especially in other cultures internationally. That's his burden, is that 
the more areas in which you are unnecessarily strict or, or you have a theologically uninformed conscience on issues, to that degree you can't flex to serve people in other contexts. So my guess is he would challenge you, understand how your conscience works so that you can flex to serve others for the sake of the gospel. Thanks. Uh, I can't bind your conscience, and it wouldn't be my aim to try to bind your conscience, but I want to ask you to visit the book table on your way out, if you would. And this particular book that we've been featuring or focusing on tonight is half price, which is a good deal. And uh, I'm not a very good salesman, but I, if you think this might make a difference to equipping you to be more like Christ, that's a, $8 is a, $7.99 is a very good investment for your conscience or for the conscience of, of people that you love. And so uh, I'm not trying to push a product. I'm trying to help us become like Jesus. Is that okay that I talk that way about this? Okay, let me pray with thanksgiving to God. I, I enjoyed when I heard Andy say when Ryan came to the microphone, I love that man. And now I want to say publicly to you, Father, and, and in the presence of these people, I love this man. I love Andy and his wife, Jenny. What a generous God you are to give the capital C church Andy Nacelli's. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You are a good God to give us gifted people like this who care about these issues and think about these issues and, and self-disclose about their own journey on these issues for our good and for your honor, for the strengthening of the church, for the benefit of the nations, and for those who haven't even come to know Jesus yet. And so I pray that more fruit would come of this conversation than that we just had a nice conversation about these um, interacting uh, questions and, and the dynamics around conscience. You've told us in the Word that we should, we should subject ourselves to authorities for the sake of conscience. And so I'm praying that we we would go out of here with submissive spirits, not bristling with conviction, overloaded with premature convictions, but that we would be willing to cooperate with civil authorities and church authorities and parental authorities and the various ones that God has brought into our, our lives. As Christ, who said to his own mother, don't you know it's not my time yet? And then he went ahead and made all that wine to serve her. Or when he was 12, he said to his parents, don't you know I must be about my father's business? And yet he was subject to them and went with them. Would you help us to have consciences that are cooperative, not just stubborn? And then make us stubborn so that we are Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednegoes when the situation calls for it. Do this and and much, much more. In Christ's name I ask, amen.